Good morning. morning. Just a sort of a brief announcement. Looks like most people have gotten the word, but with the we are going to continue to follow uh, CDC guidelines. Since the CDC changed their guidelines on was it Thursday, uh, so anybody who's fully vaccinated, you have the option of wearing a mask or not. So, um, and if the CDC guidelines change, we'll continue to follow those guidelines. Prepare for worship with our prayer. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on the church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with light. To you be given all praise, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Risen Messiah. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Glory be to you whom death could not defeat. Praise to save the Savior of heaven and earth. Honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. The first reading is a reading from Luke, chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Word of God, word of life. The good news according to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Glory to you, Lord. You are rational Galatians. Who put a spell on you? Jesus Christ was put on display as crucified before your eyes. I just want to know this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so irrational? After you started with the Spirit, you are now finishing up with your own human effort. Did you experience so much for nothing? I wonder if it really was for nothing. So does the one providing you with the Spirit and working miracles among you do this by your doing the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? Understand that in the same way that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous, those who believe are the children of Abraham. But when it saw ahead of time that God would make the Gentiles righteous on the basis of faith, Scripture preached the gospel in advance of Abraham, all the Gentiles will be blessed in you. Therefore, those who believe are blessed together with Abraham who believed. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed, so that the law became our custodian until Christ so that we might be made righteous by faith. God's children are heirs in Christ, but now that faith has come. We are no longer under a custodian. We are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. <clears throat> there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord.
So this morning I thought I would do things just a little differently than normal and kind of walk through this passage from Galatians. As I kind of mentioned last week when we had the first reading there from uh, the letter to Galatians, Paul can be sort of very confusing. And a lot of his arguments, I think, are really kind of complex. And on top of it, it becomes very hard to sort of translate Paul into sort of good English and sort of maintain the meaning uh, behind what Paul is trying to say. He uses a lot of long sentences that just don't work in English. And a lot of times he uses a lot of kind of rhetorical flourishes, which don't really come across very well into English, making it even harder, I think, sometimes for us to kind of get sort of that scope of what Paul is trying to say. And today's reading is really no different. And so I kind of wanted to sort of walk through, not quite verse by verse, but sort of section by section, this reading, uh, and hopefully make it a little bit more clear as we kind of follow Paul's argument, which really is a continuation of last week's, which I don't know about you, but I've slept since last week, so I don't really remember exactly what Paul said, but trust me, it's a continuation. <laughs> and we might be a little bit startled when it says, you are rational Galatians. This is not the kind of language that we're necessarily used to kind of reading about or hearing about in church. But Paul sort of uses it. And I think he, he kind of means it because what he is trying to get at, what he's trying to do, I think, is sort of wake the congregation in Galatia up. They have sort of followed under everything that Paul had said before, the very faith that Paul had brought and sort of in his, that established that church, they are starting to kind of fall away. They are starting to kind of go back to kind of the, the old ways. And so Paul here is, well, essentially insulting them. I think in the hopes that they will then sort of realize what is going on. It's a way to, for him to kind of grab their attention and maybe get them for a moment or two to kind of step back and realize and sort of reflect upon where and what has been going on within that community. Because if you remember, the essential problem is that these visitors had come into the church of Galatia. And they were promoting sort of the, the distinct divisions between those of sort of Jewish ethnicity and those of Gentile. And saying that if the Gentiles wanted to be part of this community, they had to go and follow kind of these pieces of the law that included things like circumcision and food laws, and only eating with specific people. And Paul here is, is, understands, and as we heard last week, is saying that that was all wrong, and we'll hear that again. And here I think he's trying to essentially say, this way of thinking is irrational. It might make sense in terms of the way that the world around them, the world around us, often works where these distinctions become things that end up dividing us. But here, Paul is saying it is an irrational thought, not because of the world, but because of the way and what God has done and is doing in and through sort of the person of Jesus. Which brings us into that kind of the second point that he makes. And here, this is where we start to kind of really run into, I think, so, some issues with the translation. Where Paul says, I just want you to know this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So he asked them a question. And on the one hand, it doesn't seem, and I think the way that we oftentimes sort of look at the act of belief, it doesn't seem like there would be that much of a difference. Because we, I think, or at least I, will oftentimes think of belief as I believe in something, essentially that I give sort of assent to certain things. So it is sort of, and if we are to kind of believe the right things, that means that it is still somehow our peace that we are doing. That as long as we believe the right things, we are good. 
which when, when contrasted with doing works of the law, doesn't seem all that different. Because I think Paul is trying to get at something more than sort of things that we do. And we'll see that more clearly when we get into the section here with Abraham. But essentially, if, it is, if people are using the law to essentially divide this congregation, that community in Galatia, Paul is trying to say the opposite. That it's not about what you have done. And I think that would also include sort of belief itself. It's not about your belief, but it is about what God has done through Jesus. Last week, Paul's entire point was it was the faithfulness of Jesus that essentially kind of rectified or justified the people who were Christ followers. And I think that thought is still going, continuing here, where it is because of what Jesus has done that these divisions have been broken down. And so it's not just about kind of believing the right things, but is more kind of a response to what had been heard. So if it is Jesus who has done this, if it was Christ's faithfulness that has essentially set and is setting the world aright, then there is sort of a response to it. But it is not an act that we ourselves have done, which I think he kind of gets at there in that last verse of, of, of that paragraph, which I think is verse 5. And then he uses Abraham, starting in verse 6. Understand that in the same way Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. <clears throat> Abraham here is being used kind of as an analogy. And while one can kind of push it too far, I think it's important to note how things were sort of translated. It's not that Abraham believed in God, but Abraham believed God. And if you remember the story of Abraham, it was God who made the promise to Abraham that Abraham would have descendants greater than he could count and that through them and through Abraham, the rest of the world would be blessed as well. And so it's not that Abraham first believed God and then the promise came, but that God acted first, that God gave the promise to Abraham. And then Abraham essentially believed or trusted in that promise. Once again, it was kind of all of God's doing. It was dependent upon God, not sort of Abraham's faithfulness or belief. And because, but because Abraham was willing to sort of believe sort of that promise, it was, had been made righteous. But it was God's promise that made Abraham righteous, not Abraham's belief in God. And so that sort of same sense of argument continues kind of throughout that paragraph. And I know, and one of the other things we kind of need to remember about Paul is that when he writes in these letters, they are all think, letters that were written for very specific situations. And so it's hard to kind of extract what Paul says and apply it on a universal scale. Because sometimes he has slightly different ideas and opinions and other letters and makes slightly different arguments because he's writing for a different situation. And so as negative as I think this passage can be on sort of the law and on sort of people of Jewish ethnicity, this is not a blanket condemnation of the Jews or Judaism in general. Instead, Paul is trying to make a specific point. He is not saying that the law is completely abandoned, that somehow what God had given originally to the Israelites in the Exodus is bad or evil, but that the way that it is maybe being used here in Galatia is the problem. In other places, letter to Philippians, for example, Paul sort of seems to say, well, he says, I am blameless under the law. So he seems to still hold it in that same high regard. 
And so it's not kind of a universal blanket condemnation. And I think where that gets into Abraham is it can be very common for us to sort of see, oh, well, now as Christians, we have become the true descendants of Abraham and sort of in place of those who are of, who are of Jews. And that is not what Paul is saying. Because Paul essentially sees the very promise that God gave to Abraham continuing in and through what God is doing with Jesus. And so it's not that, the, that Judaism has been kind of superseded or replaced by Christianity, but that there's sort of a continuation here. That what was first begun with the promises made to Abraham is now being completed in what God is doing in and through Jesus. Because part of that promise to Abraham all those centuries before Paul was that it wasn't just about sort of blessing Abraham and Abraham's descendants, the people of Israel, but, that it was, but, but through them, they were to be a blessing for the rest of the world. Or as I think Paul says, all the Gentiles will be blessed in you. And that is the part that is now being fulfilled and has been fulfilled in Jesus, which is why Paul's mission is to the Gentiles more so than the, to the Jews. He sees that with Christ, God has made it possible and has to complete the promise originally given to Abraham those thousands of years before. And so it's not one replacing the other, but kind of coming full circle. And the law that had been given is something that's not supposed to divide people, but was given as sort of a sense of guidance. It was to kind of guard the people's way. And so once again, we kind of see Paul's argument saying that Jesus doesn't kind of supersede or replace the law, but he essentially completes it. Because if the law was given sort of as a guide, or as, as it says in our reading today, as a custodian, then... Jesus completes that in that Jesus is the full expression of what God's law intended from the very beginning. And so Jesus completes or finishes or more fully reveals the guidance that was expected from the law itself. And that where those pieces in the law were meant are being used to divide, that is where those in Galatia have gone sort of off course. That is where I think Paul says that they have become irrational. And so we are no longer, now that faith has come, we are no longer other than the custodian. And that faith is, that, is the faithfulness of Jesus. And we are no longer under that custodian because Jesus has completed it. And part of what that means is that all of you who have been baptized have been clothed yourself in Christ. And so it is Christ who becomes our identity. Not whether we were male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. But it is Christ who becomes our very identity. Again, this doesn't mean sort of the washing out of sort of diversity within the human population. We all have sort of our own backgrounds. We speak different languages. We come from different cultures. All of that, I think Paul is trying to affirm. He's not saying that it has been eradicated. But in all of that diversity, we become sort of one community. We become co-communicants within the same community and respectful difference and, and respectful of that very diversity. It's not that Paul has become colorblind, but Paul understands that those are the things that no longer, because of Jesus' faith, divide us. Society oftentimes tries to tell us that those things truly matter. That those are where we find sort of our identity as people. And when we do that, we oftentimes end up forming into sort of separate tribes at odds with one another. And that is the exact opposite. 
I think what Paul is saying has been done with the, with the whole Christ event, with Christ's life, death, and resurrection. That way of seeing has been put to rest forever. And so when we see people who are different, whose skin color might be different, whose language might be different, who might be Greek or Jew or slave or free, we see who they are, but we also see them as fellow children and heirs of God and heirs of Abraham. That is sort of the radicalness that I think Paul is trying to get across to those in Galatia. That no matter who you are, no matter where you find yourself, no matter your place of origin or all of those things, you are all children of God and heirs of Abraham, part of one community. And that diversity makes the community that much stronger because it is a reflection in and of itself of God's creation. That is what Jesus has changed in the world. What Jesus' faithfulness has made possible. The inclusion of everyone as heirs of Abraham. Amen.
Let us confess our faith as found in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, who was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he has ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in love and the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Holy God, in Christ Jesus, the joy of the church is made complete. Root the church in your word and unify us as Christ's body. Send us into the world as your loving people, ready to testify to your spirit at work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Mighty God, the world is your handiwork, displaying your creative impulse. Seas teem with life, Forests reach up to praise you, and the mystery of life lies deep in the soil. Guard and keep this world for the well-being of all your creatures. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy is great. Gracious Sovereign, those who follow your ways are like trees planted near streams of water. Establish the leaders of nations and all in authority in your grace and truth. Strengthen them so that the people they serve will have abundant life. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy is great. Generous Savior, you befriend those who are sick, suffering, poor, lonely, outcast, rejected. Granted healing and love to all in need, especially those we name aloud or in our hearts. Give them tangible signs of your steadfast love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, here in this community we share the gift of praying, learning, and supporting one another. Give us thankful hearts as we claim the gifts that are unique to us and keep us from being envious of others with different gifts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, comfort victims of natural disasters, match those seeking employment with those needing employees. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Sustaining God, strengthen and protect both physically and emotionally health care workers, first responders, police, firefighters, and our military as they protect and serve others. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Saving God, your wonderful promise is the gift of eternal life in Jesus. Through the witness of those who have died in you, strengthen us now in this gift of life. We cherish the memory of your saints. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is, is great. great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray. God of love, you called us us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to the suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Let us pray, life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer the darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.